As we looked at Exodus chapter 22, you may have noticed that a big chunk of it has to do with making restitution. If someone has done you wrong, they are to make restitution for the wrong that they've done. And we are back to our Ten Commandments series, and we're up to our Eighth Commandment. And the Eighth Commandment is found in Exodus chapter 20, verse number 15, Thou shalt not steal. Thou shalt not steal. That's the title for the sermon tonight. Thou shalt not steal. Now, if I were to just take the Bible and pull out every reference and every time it teaches about stealing, this could be a very long sermon. I mean, we could make this an entire series. And so I want to take a high-level view of the thought of stealing. Of course, stealing is theft. It's to rob somebody. It's to take something that does not belong to you and to take it from someone else. Now, often when we think about the, the sin of stealing, you know, it's something that a child, you know, automatically kind of has a desire to do. You know, I remember myself as a child sometimes uh, seeing the possessions of other children or seeing possessions of other people thinking, man, I wish I could have that for myself. You know, when we go door to a soul winning, we often bring up, you know, have you, do you know what a sinner is? Have you ever sinned? And the sin that we often bring up is, of course, lying. Because, you know, it's pretty easy for people to admit, yeah, I've told a lie. You know, the other one that kind of gets brought up, maybe the second one, if you want to bring up another sin, is, you know, have you ever taken something that does not belong to you? Have you ever stolen something? Because I think the vast majority, maybe 100% of all people, have stolen something in their life. And so it just demonstrates that uh, people are sinners. These are things that are universal sins that people have uh, committed uh, throughout their life. And uh, as Exodus chapter 20, you know, that, that one commandment there, that one verse, thou shalt not steal, we then have the subsequent verses, chapter 21, chapter 22, and that's why we read through chapter 22, explain these commandments in greater detail, okay? So let's start there in Exodus chapter 22. Let's just get some general thoughts here as far as how God feels about the, st uh, the sin of stealing. It says in Exodus 22, verse number 1, it says, if a man shall steal an ox or a sheep and kill it, now, you might be wondering, why would I ever want to steal an ox or a sheep? You know, generally speaking, when we think about thefts, we think about someone breaking into the house and stealing, I don't know, a computer, a laptop, a television, something like that, okay? But of course, back in the days of the Old Testament, uh, you know, uh, they were very much a, a nation of farmers, agriculture, animals, cattle, etc. And so an ox, for example, would be such a valuable, uh, you know, it's not just an animal, it is a, a tool. It is a tool to plow the ground, to work the ground. Uh, you know, this would be equivalent to someone breaking into someone's house and stealing, you know, their toolkit. Maybe uh, you've got somebody who is a, uh, let's say, uh, a technician and in his garage has got, you know, he's invested thousands of dollars in, in his tools uh, to make his life easy and someone comes in and steals those tools away so then this man cannot do his job. So as the days go by while he tries to recover what he's lost, he's going to lose income. You know, that would be the equivalent of stealing an ox. And then you've got the sheep, and of course sheep would be something more as far as food, you know, eating a lamb, etc. And kill it, or sell it, it says in verse number 1. He shall restore five oxen for an ox, and four sheep for a sheep. Now I want you to notice, this is the law of God, you know. I, I wish Australia would look at this, you know, that our politicians, our lawmakers would look at this example that God has given, and say, you know what, our law should be the same. You know, if we stop someone that has committed theft, that we would bring a punishment equivalent to what we see in, the, in, in, the, you know, in God's laws, in God's word. So if you steal what, an ox and you get found out, what do you do? You have to restore five oxen for an ox. That makes perfect sense. You know, why? You say, well, I stole an ox and I killed it and I ate it. Uh, why can't I just restore the one ox? Because all those days, all those weeks, whatever how long it's taken to get that person found out and convicted, that person has lost income. That person has lost the ability to eat that ox if that was on the dinner menu for that week. And so you're rest restoring not just the ox that was stolen, but the, the, the um, what's the word I'm looking for? Damages. Sorry, what's that? The damages, yeah. The damages, uh, the, the cost of having lost that one item. I mean, this makes perfect sense. You steal something, you restore it fivefold, okay? And then it says there, and four sheep for a sheep. Uh, you know, I guess in, uh, the ox, the fact, the fact that five oxes were restored to the one ox that got stolen just shows that the ox is of greater value. Not only can the ox be eaten, as I said, the ox can be used to plow the ground. It would be a necessary tool uh, in the hands of the farmer. And the sheep maybe has, I guess, suppose, supposedly a lesser value. So it's, it's still four sheep though. I mean, you're still restoring more than what was stolen. Four sheep for a sheep. I think this is wonderful. 
You know, if this was a law of the land and you know this was being enforced, you know, we wouldn't lock our doors. We wouldn't be afraid of the thief coming into the house. You know, I, my, 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 I remember, I think I was about 13 years old. I'm pretty sure I was 13. I think on my 13th birthday, my parents bought me a bike, a nice white bike. I was so happy with it. You know, my, my dad told me, make sure you lock it. You know, we had a tree and we used a little lock to, to lock the, the bike on the tree. And I think I only rode it for a few months, maybe even a few weeks. I can't remember exactly. There was one night that I forgot to lock it. And guess what? He wasn't there the next morning. <laughs> I mean, that broke my heart. I was so sad. Theft, the stealing of a push bike. But you know what? If, if that one push bike would be restored to me times four, I wouldn't worry about locking it up, right? I mean, nobody would, would in their right mind, just desire to go and steal something, you know, a, a signif insignificant or something where they know if I get caught, I've got to restore fourfold. I've got to restore fivefold. You know, you wouldn't be worried about locking your house up. You wouldn't be worried about making sure the things in your backyard are all padlocked, etc., etc. You know, we would have a society that's a lot less fearful, a society that's just, you know, these are my possessions and we would respect and honor the possessions that each person has, knowing full well, if I did something to that, to that possession, then I would have to restore it uh, fourfold, fivefold. And, you know, for most people, that's something they wouldn't be able to afford. And the fact that they're still in that kind of shows that they couldn't afford it in the first place and now get restore fourfold, fivefold. I mean, I think this is perfect. These laws of God are perfect. You know, I can't wait to be in the millennium ruling with Christ and when a thief gets found out that he has to restore it fourfold. You know, he's going to get, what's he going to have to do? He's going to, he's going to say, well, judge, I can't afford it. Well, guess what? We're, going to, we're, we're judges, we're kings, we're priests on the earth. We're going to say, well, you've got to work the overtime. You know, you've got to take on a second job. You've got to go work on the weekend. Hey, no two, two, two a day weekend for you. You've got to go work extra to make sure you can afford to pay back the four times, the fourfold or the fivefold of the thing that was stolen. I can't wait for these laws of God to be brought in the millennial reign of Jesus Christ. Let's keep going there in Exodus 22, verse number 20, verses 2. If a thief be found breaking up and be smitten that he die, there shall no blood be shed for him. I've preached on this in the past. Basically, if a thief breaks into your house and dies, you know, you, you just, you're protecting your, your house, you're protecting your family and dies, you know, you're not guilty of murder. But that's not what I'm focused on today. Let's keep going there, verse number 3. If the sun be risen upon him, there shall be blood shed for him, for he should make full restitution. If he have nothing, then he should be sold for his theft. Wow. So if this guy gets found out as he breaks in and you capture this guy, you know what he was going to steal, he's got to make restitution. You say, in what way does he have to bring restitution? We'll keep going and show it. But notice what happens if he can't pay for it. What if he can't make restitution? What if he can't ba pay back double or fourfold or, or threefold? What's he got? He's sold for his theft. Okay. Now, of course, this is not slavery. The Bible does not teach slavery. God is not in favor of slavery. This is about selling yourself, selling somebody into servitude. Okay. This is how employment worked back in the days of the Bible. That if you needed to uh, have an income or you couldn't afford something, you would sell yourself for a period of time. You know, no longer than six years on the seventh year, that would be a Sabbath. You'd be let go. This is not slavery. You're selling yourself into servitude so you can afford to pay for something down the track. Okay? And, uh, you know, I, I don't know, you know, I don't, I don't recommend watching movies and television much. But what this reminds me a lot of, and, you know, I've seen a lot of shows like this, where maybe you have some people going out, some friends going out to a restaurant, okay? And, and they, they, they eat a meal and then the, the bill comes and they can't afford it. They realize that, you know, nobody can pay or it just becomes much, much more exp expensive than they wanted. And so what happens, they, they basically have to admit that they can't afford to pay for the meal. So they're taken and put into the, into the back, you know, kitchen and they're made to wash the dishes and stuff like that. I'm sure we've all maybe seen that kind of on television or something like that. But that's the idea. If you can't afford what you've just taken, then you better be, better be sold off into servitude, hey, go wash some dishes, go earn an income so you can pay off what you've taken. Hey, that is the biblical approach. If they can't afford it, they're to be sold into servitude. Let's keep going there in verse number four. If the theft be certainly found in his hand alive. Whether, so this is kind of being caught red-handed. Before he's able to take the ox or the ass or the sheep, whatever it is, before he's able to take it and kill it or use it for himself, it says if he's caught red-handed, basically, if the theft be certainly found in his hand alive, whether it be ox or ass or sheep, he shall restore double. So that's making full restitution. 
So if someone breaks into your house, okay, and, oh man, here's a mobile phone, I'm going to steal this phone. And as they're heading out, they get caught, they get captured. They're captured red-handed before they can actually do any damage. Well, they're to bring restitution. Hey, yeah, return back the phone that you took and now double it. Now give another phone. That's, that's the way. That's what the Bible teaches. You know, just giving back what you're about to steal, that's not restitution. What did it say? Restore double. He shall restore double. And so you can see, if, if, if you know that, you know, in, by the laws of God, if things are going to be taken off your hand, and you're going to get at least double, maybe threefold, maybe fourfold, you're not going to be worried about theft. You're not going to be fearful about people taking your things. In fact, you might even invite the thief over. Hey, come and check out my stuff. Uh, you know? No, you wouldn't do that. But you know what? I mean, you wouldn't have that fear, would you? You know, God's laws trumps the laws of man. And as, the, as we saw there, the, this is the eighth commandment. Thou shall not steal. Now, let's go to the book of Proverbs. Actually, no, before we go to the book of Proverbs, let's go to Exodus 21. Exodus 21. Because there is a theft that isn't just um, restitution in this sense. Uh, there is a type of theft that you just can't repay back. And so the punishment for this crime is even greater. Let's look at Exodus 21 and verse number 16. Exodus 21 and verse number 16. Exodus 21, verse number 16. It says, And he that stealeth a man. Did you know you can steal a man? You know, if you kidnap somebody, right? If you take someone into slavery, that is stealing a man. You know, human trafficking. If you take somebody and you sell them off, you know, against their will for perverted reasons, brethren, this is stealing a man. What is the punishment for this? It says, And he that stealeth a man and selleth him, or if he be found in his hand, he shall surely be put to death. Amen. Listen, God is in favor for the death penalty. Amen. You steal a man, you steal a life that God has given, whether you've, it's still in your hand, whether you're caught red-handed or not, you're, you're going to die to death. This is what the Bible teaches. Amen. God is in favor for the death penalty. Could you imagine if slavery, kidnapping, human trafficking, if the punishment in Australia was the death penalty, then again, we wouldn't be afraid, right? We would, people, we would know that if someone steps in, and look, there's going to be wicked people anyway. You know, wicked people are going to try to push the boundaries as much as they can. But if we as a society know that there's death penalty for kidnapping, once again, aren't we going to feel safer on the streets? Aren't we going to realize, hey, it's less likely for somebody to just step in and take somebody and, and do what they wish with them? I mean, I just heard just recently, just the past few days, wasn't there like a nine-year-old girl that was kidnapped from the, I think the Blue Mountain, I don't know, maybe the Blue Mountains region or somewhere up there, you know? And, and the man, you know, her body, you know, a 31-year-old man took that nine-year-old girl, okay, I don't know what he's done to her, but, you know, she, she was, her body was found in a barrel, okay? You know what that man deserves? The death penalty. No questions asked. You know, if he's definitely com uh, committed, uh, the, 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 if, you know, if he's found guilty, it should be the death penalty. But, you know, this shows us how far our nation is from the laws of God. We find that every time our nation introduces new laws, it just gets further and further and further away from the laws of God. You know, God has given us these instructions, these crimes, these punishments, to show us how a nation ought to be run. You know, this, this was the laws for a nation, God's physical nation on the earth. And if this was God's laws for His physical nation on this earth, shouldn't it be this the laws of all the nations of the earth? If our nations fear God? Unfortunately, again, you can see how far our nation, our politicians, our lawmakers are from the heart of God. But, you know, sometimes I get asked the question, well, Pastor Kevin, why, you know, why preach this stuff? You know, we know that our nation is not necessarily going to change. We know that our nation is not going to necessarily bring in the death penalty. Why preach it? Well, we preach it so we know what God says. You know, because when, when we realize God's laws, we just realize, you know what? God is just. God is righteous. God knows best. And for there to be, for, for there to be a prophet in a nation that is telling the truth of what God's word says. We are, we are so far away from the truth of God's word. Please go to Proverbs 22. Go to Proverbs 22. Now, as you, I'm sure you know, the book of Proverbs is the book of wisdom, okay? Book of wisdom. So we're going to just have a look at some references here in the book of Proverbs, what God has to say about theft. 
And, uh, you know, I think by looking at some of these, we can kind of start to develop our thoughts around what theft really is. And if you look at Proverbs 22, Proverbs 22, verse 22, Proverbs 22 and verse 22, it says, rob not the poor. Now, first of all, you shouldn't rob anybody, <laughs> okay? But it's making a very specific thought here. Look, if there's poor among you, there are people that are downtrodden and without don't go and rob that one person. Now, this happens, brethren, because the poor are usually more, uh, what's the word I'm looking for? They're, they're usually more susceptible to, to being hurt, okay? Rob not the poor because he is poor, neither oppress the afflicted in the gate. Why? You know, here's the thing, brethren. You know, you may decide to go and, and, and rob somebody one day. You might decide to go and commit theft one day. You know what, if there's someone poor and needy and you think this is such an easy target, I'm going to take advantage of this situation, I'm not going to get caught. Brethren, there's going to be a massive punishment for you, much greater than a punishment if you rob the rich. Because it says in verse number 23, For the Lord will plead their cause and spoil the soul of those that spoiled them. You see, the, the, God, the Lord God looks upon the poor. Okay, and he protects them. He pleads their cause. You steal from the poor, you may as well be stealing from the Lord God. And he's going to step in and make sure that you get spoiled, that you get robbed, as it were, from your possessions. Uh, and, and as we keep bringing these thoughts, I want you to start thinking about what theft really is, as I said. So if I steal from the poor, the Lord's going to step in and plead their cause. And one thing that, that um, I started to develop in my teenage years when I was thinking about the commandments of God, I was thinking about sin and, and the commandments and, and trying to live a righteous life, I kind of um, concluded, and you know, I haven't come across anything to prove this wrong, but I concluded that every sin is basically theft. Like when you think about every sin that you can commit, the underlying you know, thought behind that or the underlying root of that is theft. There is theft that's taking place. And I'm going to prove that to you a bit later, okay? But, I, you know, throughout the many years of my life, I've not been able to think of a single sin that I could not give an equivalence to theft, all right? We'll keep going. I'll prove that to you in a moment. Please go to Proverbs 28. Please go to Proverbs 28 and verse number 24. Proverbs chapter 28 and verse number 24. Now, unfortunately, we live in a generation that is spoilt, spoilt rotten. A generation that is self-entitled, okay? And, you know, we live in a generation where they feel that whatever belongs to mum and dad, that's mine. That's rightfully mine. And you have children that would steal from their parents, that would steal from their mother and father. It says here in Proverbs 28, verse 24, Whoso robbeth his father or his mother, and saith, it is no transgression. Look, he's stolen from mum and dad. He's gone to mother's purse and taken that $20 note, put it in his pocket. I've not done nothing wrong. It's my parents. My parents are meant to provide for me, aren't they? If I take from my parents, hey, isn't it all going to be mine eventually, one day, potentially, if I were to inherit something? No, whoso robbeth his father or his mother and say if it is no transgression, the same is the companion of a destroyer. What is, a destroyer is someone that would come and destroy the things that you own. Brethren, stealing from your parents is like being a companion, a friend to someone that wants to destroy your parents. Children, pay attention to these words. God does not want you robbing from mother and father. They're probably the easiest targets to rob from because you know your parents love you. And you know that maybe you know, there are things laying around the house that are valuable. You know, mom and dad, they're not going to be thinking that my kids are going to steal from us. And so there's going to be values laying around. There might be money laying around in different places. And that could bring the temptations for children to steal from mother and father. You know, if you do that, you're basically helping uh, your, your parents to be destroyed. You know, it's such a sad thing when I see children fighting uh, amongst themselves, amongst brothers and sisters, amongst uncles and, and aunties, etc., for the parents' inheritance. And everyone wants a greater portion that than what was rightfully belonging to them. You know what? This is destruction. This is sinful. This is theft. Let's go to Proverbs chapter 6. Proverbs chapter 6 and verse number 30. Proverbs chapter 6 and verse number 30. 
Proverbs chapter 6 and verse number 30. Now, there are going to be times that someone does commit theft. And there is, I suppose, one reason why someone might steal and you might have compassion upon that person. In the sense that you would understand where they're coming from. Now, if someone comes into your house and steals your TV or steals your laptop or whatever it is, steals your phone, you're not going to have any compassion for them. I mean, obviously, you know they're stealing out of their lusts. You know, if someone takes it and steals your car, you know, you know that that's just, that's just a, a, they, had, they had a lust, they've just had a, a crazy desire for that object. You know, covetousness overwhelmed them, they've taken something that was not necessary for them to take. You're not going to have compassion upon that person, are you? But when it comes to people that are hungry, it says here in Proverbs chapter 6, verse 30, men do not despise a thief if he steal to satisfy his soul when he is hungry. You know, if someone is so poor and they're so hungry or they've got a wife and children to take care of and the man's lost his job and he's in a bad place financially and he just says, look, I, I just need to steal to just eat just to help my, parent, my, my family have something in their belly. Then you're not going to necessarily despise that thief, are you? You kind of understand. I mean, this is like a necessity. Food is an absolute necessity of life. And so, you know, in this sense, you know, you will have a greater compassion for someone that is stealing uh, for food. But that's not to say it's okay to steal for food. Okay, it's not okay. It's still a sin. It's still one of the Ten Commandments. Because it says as we keep going in verse number 31, but if he be found, okay, he shall restore sevenfold. He shall give all the substance of his house. Wow. Someone is so poor, so hungry, he goes and steals to feed himself. Listen, the society at large is not going to be angry at him. I understand why he stole. You know, he's got children to feed, etc., etc. But you don't get away with it. Okay? You get found out, you've got to restore sevenfold. You know, you steal a loaf of bread, now you've got to restore seven loaves of bread. In fact, even though this person is poor, you can take all the substance of his house to make rest rest restoration for what he stole. And so we're not trying to say it's ever fine to steal, but what the Bible's teaching us here is there is one reason why, why we may have compassion on people when they steal. It's when they're hungry or their family's hungry and they've done that. Nevertheless, you know, they still have to be punished. They're still to be judged. They're still to make full restitution for what they've taken. Let's go to another Proverbs. Proverbs chapter 30, please. Proverbs chapter 30 and verse number 8. Proverbs chapter 30 and verse number 8. And I think when we look at Proverbs 38 and 9, I think this should really be the heart of all of us. You know, no matter who you are, no matter what generation you're part of, no matter how much you make on the job, no matter what your wealth or possessions are, it doesn't matter whether you own a house, it doesn't matter whether you're renting a property, I think all our hearts should be resting upon what we see here in verses 8 and 9. It says, Remove far from me vanity and lies. Then it says this, Give me neither poverty nor riches. It says, God, I, I don't want to be so poor where I'm, I'm hungry and I'm going without and I don't have my needs met. But Lord, I also don't want all the riches. You know, I don't want to be excessively wealthy, Lord. You know, we need to be somewhere in the middle. Middle class, isn't that what they call it? Middle class. But why? Why is that? It says, feed me with food convenient for me. Lord, give me enough that is just convenient for me to get through life. Verse number nine. This is the reason why. Lest I be full and deny thee. If I, get, if I become too rich, too wealthy, Lord, I'm going to start denying you. I'm going to start thinking that I'm successful because of myself. Look how great I am. You know, I'm so rich. I'm, I'm powerful. I've got influence. And you, and you start to, to deny the Lord God when you have too much. And say, who is the Lord? Or Look at this. Or lest I be poor and still and take the name of my God in vain. And so, if a Christian goes and steals, just to satisfy hunger, satisfy the necessities, you are taking the name of God in vain. Notice that. As I said to you, you know, when you steal, really, you know, and, and this is the truth for every sin, but you know, every sin that you commit, even if you're stealing from your fellow man, you are really stealing from the Lord God. You need to understand that. That if you steal from your fellow man, you are really stealing from the Lord God. And the reason, if you can please go to Matthew, turn to Matthew chapter 5. 
I'll just give you a couple of verses to think about this. Turn to Matthew chapter 5, please. Matthew chapter 5. And while you're turning to Matthew chapter 5, I'm going to read to you from James chapter 1, verse 17. James chapter 1, verse number 17 says, Every, okay, this is every, every good gift and every perfect gift is from above and cometh down from the Father of lights, with whom is no variableness, neither shadow of turning. You know, every gift that we have, every possession that God has given us has come from our Father of lights. Everything that we own, brethren, everything that we have has been given to us from our Father. My wife has been given to me by God. My job has been given to me by God. My bank account has been given to me by God. Whatever gift you have, whatever vehicle you drive, brethren, I don't care if it's a Porsche or I don't care if it's a beat up Toyota Corolla, brethren, it's from the Lord if you've been given some beautiful gift. It's from the Lord. And so if everything that we have is from the Lord and you go and you take from somebody else, who are you truly stealing from? Because why does that person have that possession? It's because the Father of Lights has given it to them. Okay, and you say, well, hold on, isn't that just for the believers, Pastor Kevin? Well, that's why I want you to turn to Matthew chapter 5. Matthew chapter 5 and verse number 45. Matthew chapter 5, verse number 45. It says, that ye may be the children of your Father which is in heaven, for he maketh the, his Son to rise on the evil and on the good, and sendeth rain on the just and on the unjust. You see, the Lord blesses the good and the evil. The Lord blesses the believer and the sinner. Yes, it does. When the sun rises, yes, we praise God. God, thank you for giving us a new day. Thank you for giving us a morning, a new morning for me to serve you. But then, Lord, also thank you for giving the sun for this unjust, wicked world as well. These are gifts that come from God. God gives us life. He's given us new days. And those gifts are given to not just believers, but even to the evil, even to the wicked, even to the unjust. You see, everything that we have, brethren, is because it's been given to us from God. And if you go and steal from your fellow man, you're truly stealing something that God has given them, for them. Okay? Every good gift and every perfect gift is from above. Can you please now turn to Leviticus chapter 19? Please turn to Leviticus chapter 19. Leviticus chapter 19, please. Now, we're never going to fix poverty in this world. There is always going to be poor among us. This gets repeated multiple times in the Bible. Even Jesus Christ said these words. Okay? There is always the poor among us. Okay? You can never get rid of poverty. All right. I, I don't care if you think you know, we get the best politicians and the best governments in the world. They're still not going to fix poverty. It's going to be something that's always in, in the world. Okay? And so there's always going to be people. And look, I, I, you know, please differentiate from just the lazy bum. Okay? The, the lazy, homeless bum that just refuses to work. That just refuses to be productive. And he's poor on purpose. Yes, he's poor on purpose. You know, in Australia, you get welfare for doing nothing, brethren. You know what? I mean, in Australia, I don't even know. How can you be poor in Australia when the government takes from those that work, the taxpayers, and gives it to the bum? And yet that bum is still, hopeless, is still homeless. That bum is still not working. Brethren, that guy is poor because of what he's done. He's chosen to be poor. I'm not talking about that person. When we talk about the poor, we're talking about people that have come in at a bad place. You know, they've just come and they've hit some hard times. You know, that they, maybe they've lost their job. They want to get back to work, but they're just unable to find a job, etc., etc. All right? Or they just live in a corrupt country where the government steal the riches of the people and people are going without. I mean, we're not talking about the lazy bum here. Please don't misunderstand me. There are some people that are legitimately poor and there are other people that are poor because they want to be poor. Okay, most of the homeless in Australia, I would probably say the vast majority, are purposely poor. Okay, they want to be homeless. They want to just give me the handouts. That's, what they, that, that's how they want to live. Okay, I'm not talking about them. But you see, even though there's always been poverty, and there always will be poverty in the world, you know, God's perfect laws always made sure these poor people 
would at least have enough food to feed themselves. Where they would not then have a desire to go and steal from other people, take what belongs to someone else. Look up Leviticus 19, verse number 9. As I said to you, this nation, this physical nation of Israel, was a nation of agriculture. It was a nation of farming, okay? It says in Leviticus 19, verse 9, And when ye reap the harvest of your land, thou shalt not wholly reap the corners of thy field, neither shalt thou gather the gleanings of thy harvest. And thou shalt not glean thy vineyard, neither shalt thou gather every grape of thy vineyard. Thou shalt leave them for the poor and stranger. I am the Lord your God. What is he saying? He says when you're farming your land, let's say you're growing grapes, you know, vineyard, for example. You know, and you start to collect the grapes for the harvest, you know, to make a profit, to make a living. God says, just leave a little bit around the ground, right? You know, as you, you've gone and harvested, and, and for those that have been dro- dropped on the floor, or those that are still just kind of got missed, just leave them there. You don't have to go and collect every grape. He says, when it comes to the corners of your field, don't worry about the corners, just, just leave the borders alone. But come inside, you, you know, obviously, take of your harvest, take of the, the vast majority that is within the borders. But when it comes to the outside borders, just, just leave them alone. Why? For the poor and the stranger of the land. You know, someone's just passing through the land. Maybe they don't even intend to make themselves a home in Israel. They're just passing through and they're just, you know, man, I'm on a journey. I'm getting hungry. I'm low on food. And they walk past a farm. If people are following the the laws of God, they're going to be able to see and and walk past the boundaries, walk past the fences, I suppose, and just pick from whatever fruit there is. And God allowed that. That is not theft. You know, and that's how God, this is, this is the law of God. And and you know what, Uh, the, 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 um, the, uh, what's the word I'm looking for? Man, the words are just not, are not coming to me right now. But when it comes to the, uh, what do you call someone that wants more? Greed, greedy. All right. Obviously, this stops greed, right? I mean, it teaches you to, to take the vast majority and to leave it for others that are downtrodden, right? But the greedy, you know what they're going to want to do? They're going to want to take every little grape, every little orange that came on their land, say, no, this is all for me. I did all the hard work. And this is all for me. I can't go in and lose a portion of my, my fruit and veggies, etc., etc. But you know what? God's ways are so perfect. I, I have no doubt if you just do things in accordance to God's ways, even though you think you're going to suffer loss, but what about all the fruit around the boundaries? I'm going to suffer loss. You know what? If you do things in accordance to God's word, I have no doubt that God's going to bless you even more than what you supposedly lost. You know, you're going to have greater, greater fruitful uh, you know, uh, crops the next season, God's going to bless you in a greater way if you keep according, according to his ways. But you see, God made allowances for the poor, for those that are downtrodden, right? If the, instead of, you know, going hungry and going, well, you know, I need to steal. No, God has provided a way for us to just meet our basic needs, our food. You know, God has a heart for the strangers passing through and for the poor as well. It says here, verse number 11, Ye shall not, this, so notice that, ye shall not steal. Why is that straight after that? Because God knows, listen, this is one way to help society not become full of theft. Robbers, okay? If, you, if people just get the basic needs, they're not going to have this desire to steal. Verse number 11, ye shall not steal, neither deal falsely, neither lie one to another. Ye shall not swear by my name falsely, neither shall thou profane the name of thy God. I am the Lord. And notice this. And thou shalt not defraud thy neighbor, neither rob him. You know, we can rob our neighbors. We can rob our society. How? It says, The wages of him that is hired shall not abide with thee all night until the morning. You know what? What is this saying? If someone's done a job for you, pay him. Okay? And don't delay. Pay in accordance to the agreement you have. You know, we can apply this in many ways. Brethren, as soon as I get a bill... You know what I do? You get a bill, don't you normally get like 30 days? Let's say you get a water bill, electricity bill, maybe you get about 30, 20 to 30 days. You know, this is the due date. Reverend, if you don't pay on the due date, you know what you're doing? You're robbing that organization. That's what you're doing, you're robbing them. You know what I do? To not even get to that point of the due date, as soon as I see that bill, I don't care what's in my bank account, I don't care what I want, I say, like, this is a bill that needs to be paid, and I pay it immediately. Just, just, it's paid, it's done, I've got a service, I've got to pay it, done. I don't want to get to the point where I get past the due date potentially because that would be me robbing. 
you know, going longer with this money, you know, uh, you know, for, for, uh, nights where the people that actually gave the service, that did the job, you know, are not profiting from that labor that they've given you, that service that they've given you. You know, I've got some guy coming potentially tomorrow to install an inbuilt wardrobe in one of our bedrooms. You know what? And he, let's, say, let's say he does come tomorrow. Let's say he gets the job done and I don't pay him on the day. You know, I just say, well, I'll, I'll pay you, uh, you know, a week from now. You know what? God says I'm robbing my neighbor from doing that. Okay? What is agreed, what is due, you pay it at the right time and you don't rob. You know, so, you know, you may not have ever that desire to break into someone's house and steal from, from them. But if someone's given you service, someone's given you goods, and you've got an agreed time to pay, you better pay it before, you know, you don't want to go over, over uh, past the due date of that time, otherwise you are robbing your neighbor. Now let's go to Malachi chapter 3, please. Let's go to Malachi chapter 3. And uh, as I was sort of speaking to somebody in our church about, you know, preaching on stealing, on theft, on robbing, you know, this individual said to me, are you going to talk about the tithe? <laughs> and I thought, well, I didn't really think about that. But yes, that actually is theft. It is robbing if you don't pay your tithe to your local church. And you know, Malachi chapter 3, please. Malachi chapter 3. And I, I, I just be honest. I'm just being completely honest with you. I don't really like preaching about tithing. Because what is tithing? Tithing is taking 10% of your increase okay whatever you've you've made more of you know that week or the, whatever it is that you get paid or whatever you get you then take 10 percent of that and you give it to the lord god through the local church that's what tithing is i mean when you haven't tithed in your life it's actually quite a you know it's a big ask and i i know i know what i'm i know how big that ask is because i remember you know i i did not tithe for a large chunk of my life. I didn't even know about it. I didn't even know this was something that needed to be done in the house of God until one day I heard the preaching on it. And this was a time when my wife and I, Christine, well, she wasn't my wife yet. We were planning to get married. We were trying to put our income together, our money together for our, for our wedding, for our future. And then I learned, and, and we didn't have much, brethren. And then I learned about tithing. And I'm like, oh, no. <laughs> I don't have much, Lord. But you're telling me that I need to take 10% of this and give it to the house of God? And then whatever it is that we earn in the future, we need to take 10% of that and continue giving it to the house of God. It was a big ask. I, I, I know, okay? But you know what? We did it. And I'm telling you now, I truly believe I've been blessed. Not just, I'm not talking about financially here. I'm talking about with children. I've been blessed with my life. I'm happy, brethren. And I truly believe it's the blessings of God that comes upon you. You know, the, the people sometimes they think the blessings are just the bank account. If I give my tithe to the, to the church, then God's got to give me like, you know, uh, $100,000 in my bank account, like a surprise, right? Like the Pentecostals think. You know, you go and give your tithe and they say, if you give a seed of $1,000, God's going to give you riches if you have the faith. You know what? When it comes to the blessings of God, it can be in so many different ways. In fact, we'll have a look at some of those blessings here. Malachi chapter 3, verse number 8. Malachi chapter 3, verse number 8. It says, will, will a man rob God? Can you rob God? It's a hypothetical question in a way. You can't really rob God, can you? Okay. You can't go into God's you know, mansions and steal from him. Okay. But then it says, yet ye have robbed me. You have robbed me. You have robbed God. But ye say, wherein have we robbed thee? In tithes and offerings. Now look, when it comes to the offerings... Okay, in the Old Testament, that offering system has been fulfilled in Christ. Christ has become our offering, that one-time offering of his life in exchange for us. And so we don't come in the New Testament bringing a lamb sacrifice, an ox or whatever it is, sheep, right, uh, to, to give us an offering for the Lord. But the tithe has not been fulfilled. There is no fulfillment of a New Testament truth when it comes to the tithe. This is something that has continued. But look, look at this in verse 9. Ye are cursed with a curse, for ye have robbed me, even this whole nation. So there is a curse that can fall upon you if you don't tithe. And so there's a part of me that doesn't like to preach on tithing because I don't want people to think that I'm just asking, I just bring in the money, right? And for people to think that I'm this money-hungry preacher. Brethren, I am not. I tell you the truth, I'm not some money. If I was money-hungry, brethren, I would not be a pastor of an independent fundamental Baptist church. I'll tell you that, okay? If I wanted money, I would be doing anything else but being a pastor of a church like ours. But I don't want you to be cursed. I, I don't want you robbing God. 
That's what I don't want for your life. Okay? It's, it's not just the blessings that come with tithing, which is wonderful, but if you don't tithe, you're going to go without. Okay? Look at verse number 10. Bring you all the tithes in the storehouse, that there may be meat in mine house. And, and I love the next words. And prove me now herewith, saith the Lord of hosts, if I will not open you the windows of heaven and pour you out a blessing, that there shall not be room enough to receive it. God says, look, bring your tithes, and, and he puts you to the test. He goes like, prove me. I'm going to show you that if you tithe, I'm going to bless you. That you're going to have in abundance. You're going to receive the blessings of God. You won't have enough room to receive the blessings. That's how I feel with my children. We didn't have enough bedrooms for our kids. I don't have enough room for the blessings that God has given me. But then it says there in verse number 11, not only the blessings of having more and having abundance of blessings of God, but there's also another part of tithing that a lot of people don't think about in verse number 11. He says, and I will rebuke the devourer for your sakes, for he shall not destroy the fruits of your ground, neither shall your vine cast the fruit before the time in the field, saith the Lord of hosts. And so the Lord is speaking about this devourer. I don't know if it's this, this is the devil or a, you know, a, a type of an angel or if it's just the laws of physics. You know, we, we know the laws of thermodynamics, the fact that everything breaks down over time. Okay? But the Bible's saying this, that if you tithe, not only is God going to bless you abundantly, but He's going to stop destruction in your life. He's going to stop the destroyer. You know what this means? This means if you tithe, your car's going to last you a lot longer if you don't tithe. If you tithe your fridge, your washing machine, your dishwasher, your household, the hinges on your door, they're going to last longer than if you don't tithe. Okay? This means you're going to be spending less on maintenance because God's going to make sure things last a lot longer. When you don't tithe, you allow the destroyer, you allow the devourer to come in and take, you know, destroy things that belong to you. And then you're paying for maintenance, you're paying for replacement, and basically you're paying back the tithe that you should have just given to the house of God and received the blessings. Instead, your things are being taken away from you because you're not giving your tithe to the storehouse. And so, brethren, even though I don't like to preach it because I don't want to have that perception that I'm like this money-hungry preacher, I, mean, I am not, but it's a necessity to preach. Because if you don't tithe, you are robbing from God. And if you don't tithe, you're losing on the blessings. If you don't tithe, things are going to break down around your house. You're going to be wondering, why is this broken down? Why is this broken down? Why is this not lasting as long as I thought it should? It's because the devourer is taking advantage of you. Okay? And, and you know what? It's not just how much you make, but it's also how you spend. You know, the, the, the greater way of to, to become abundant is, to, is, is not necessarily having a greater income, but it's, it's managing what you do have, you know, and, and, and spending less, you know, spending less on, 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 you know, things that are not necessary. But if you don't tithe, the devourer will come and cause you to have great expenditures that you wouldn't have had otherwise if you did tithe. And so, brethren, this is also a great part of thou not, shall not steal. I do believe we can apply the point, the, uh, the thought of tithing, the, the requirement of tithing here in this commandment. Can you please turn to John chapter 10? Please turn to John chapter 10 and verse number 9. John chapter 10 and verse number 9. Another thought when it comes to stealing is the gospel. It's salvation as well. In, in what sense? Well, look at the words of Christ here in John chapter 10 verse number 9. John chapter 10 verse number 9. Jesus Christ says, I am the door. By me, if any man enter in, he shall be saved and shall go in and out and find pasture. Not only does Jesus Christ save us if we come to Him, but He leads us to pastures. He gives us the things that we need to have a great life. But then He says in verse number 10, The thief cometh not, but for to steal, and to kill, and to destroy. I am come that they might have life, and that they might have it more abundantly. I am the good shepherd. The good shepherd giveth his life for the sheep. Now, brethren, what is Christ saying? He says, look, he's the good shepherd. He's given his life. He has died for his sheep. And the reason for this is that we can be saved and enter in and find the green pastures. That is salvation. Salvation is that Jesus Christ has done all the work. All we have to do is believe in him to trust that he's done everything necessary for us to go to heaven. You know, through Christ, we have those green pastures. 
But then you have false gospels. You have other people, other ways, as it were, of salvation. Good works, going to church, confessing your sins to a priest. Other things that people say, you've got to have the works or you're not saved. You know what? Who are these people? They are not the good shepherd. They are a thief that comes to steal, to kill, to destroy. You see, when a false prophet leads someone to a false gospel, you know, when someone is damning you know, an individual to hell, when a false prophet is stopping someone from entering the kingdom of heaven, he is stealing his opportunity, that man's opportunity to be saved. And he's taking advantage of that individual. Brethren, salvation, the gospel, is free. It's a gift. It's something that we can receive freely with no strings attached. But when people are attaching strings to your salvation, they want you to become a servant of them. Instead of them offering the good shepherd who gave his life for the sheep, they're saying, hey, what are you willing to do? How much of your life are you willing to give up to be saved? Hey, these people are thieves as well. Prophets, preachers, pastors that preach a false gospel, they are thieves and they're leading people to hell. You know what Jesus Christ says in Matthew 23, verse 13, But woe unto you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites, for ye shut up the kingdom of heaven against men. For ye neither go in yourselves, neither suffer ye them that are entering to go in. He says there are people that are seeking salvation, people that are asking these scribes and Pharisees, what must I do to be saved? And they're stopping them. They're giving them a false gospel. They're not pointing them to Jesus Christ. Then he says, Woe unto you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites, for ye devour widows' houses, and for a pretense make long prayer, therefore ye shall receive the greater damnation. You see, these false prophets, they're interested in stealing. They're interested in finding the widow, the poor, the easy targets, and devouring or taking of them for themselves the things that belong to, other, to others. This is why they're thieves. These false prophets preaching a false gospel, they are thieves. They are not a shepherd that loves the sheep. Now, can you please go to Matthew chapter 6, please? Let's go to Matthew chapter 6 and verse number 19. Matthew chapter 6 and verse number 19. As I said to you, brethren, if we just had these laws of God, we know that those that commit theft would have to restore double, threefold, fourfold, etc. As I said to you, we'd have a much better society. We wouldn't be afraid of losing things. We wouldn't have to you know, lock up everything and protect all our stuff, right? Now, even though we might, uh, you know, I've mentioned that and that is 100% true. We can still live in this way, though. Like, we can still live with that same hope that the things that I have can never be stolen, okay? But this is not a carnal, earthly reality. This is something that applies to our spiritual life. Jesus Christ says to you in Matthew chapter 6, verse 19, Brethren, if you want to have a life that you know your possessions cannot be stolen, then this is the life that you need to live. In Matthew chapter 6, verse number 19, Matthew chapter 6, verse number 19, Jesus Christ says, Lay not up for yourselves treasures upon earth, where moth and rust doth corrupt, and where thieves break through and steal. So we all have possessions. Some of us have earthly possessions. We all have some earthly possessions. And then Christ says, no, but you know what? We also ought to have possessions in heaven. We ought to lay up treasures in heaven, not on this earth. Because in heaven, the thief cannot break in and steal. Hey, that sounds wonderful. Possessions, treasures, Brethren, we've got a mansion in heaven. We've got possessions. If you serve God, you know, you've got rewards that He's going to give you. And these things can never be stolen. You know what? Those mansions in heaven, we don't have to lock the door. Okay? We don't have to tie up the bike if there's a bike in heaven. We don't have to tie up the ox and the sheep and, and hide it from other people. Because the thieves cannot break in and steal. Verse number 20. But lay up for yourselves treasures in heaven, where neither moth nor rust of corrupt, and where thieves do not break through, nor steal. And now verse 21 says, For where your treasure is, there will your heart be also. Brethren, where is your heart tonight? Is your heart on the heavenly treasures? Is your heart on treasures on this earth? Now brethren, we have to have some element of treasure. We have to have some element of possessions and resources to just live on this earth. Praise God. There's nothing wrong with that in of itself. And brethren, if you have some riches, you have some great possessions, Thank God because that gift came from the Father of Light. We've seen that before. Okay, it belongs to you. But don't have your heart set on this earth. Don't have your heart set on becoming some rich, wealthy, you know, 
person with all the, all the pleasures of this life because the, the moths can come in, the thieves can break in and steal it, brethren. Lay up your treasures in heaven. Give your time to do the service for God. Lay up your treasures in heaven where thieves cannot break in and steal. Amen. That's where our heart ought to be. And so we can all already live in that reality that, hey, I'm not afraid of things getting lost. I'm not afraid of things getting stolen. Okay? But we're not going to see that reality right now on this earth. But we can live that reality with our hearts set on eternity, with our eyes set on heaven and, and the greater spiritual realm that we're going to enter one day. And we're going to live there for all eternity, the new heavens and the new earth that God will create. And as I said to you um, earlier in the sermon, that a thought occurred to me in my teenage years that basically every sin has the underlying sort of sin of theft, of stealing within it. And let me just give you some examples. We've been going through our Ten Commandments series, okay? So let's just go through the Ten Commandments, just as an example. And then I want you to just think of other sins that you can kind of think about, and then see if you can align it with stealing it to some extent, okay? So commandment number one, thou shalt have no other gods before me. So how is that theft, if you have other gods? Well, you're stealing the Lord's position as God. You know, if you have other gods, false gods, you're taking away that position that rightly belongs to the Lord God and you're giving it to others. Right. Commandment number two, thou shalt not make unto thee any graven image. Well, what's that? Why do people make graven images? To worship them, okay? So how is this theft? Well, you're stealing worship that belongs to the Lord God and you're giving that worship to some false god. Commandment number three, remember the Sabbath day to keep it holy. Now, we've already seen that the Sabbath day was a picture of the Sabbath rest of salvation that can be found in Christ. And so if you corrupted that Sabbath day, if you did not keep it um, holy, you are stealing, stealing the gospel message. Okay? You're stealing the rest that can be found in Christ Jesus. And you're saying that salvation is by works rather than by resting on what Christ has done. Commandment number four. Thou shalt not take the name of the Lord thy God in vain. And so if you do take the Lord's name in vain, brethren, you're stealing the reverence that we should have towards God's name. You're not revering and praising the name of God if you take it in vain. You're stealing that reverence. Commandment number five, honor thy father and thy mother. Brethren, if you're not honoring your parents, you're stealing the honor that rightfully belongs to your mother and father. Okay? Then we have, thou shalt not steal. Well, if, uh, sorry, that shall not kill. That shall not kill. What is that? That is still in a man's life. You know, a life that God has given a, a man. You go and murder someone. You've stolen that life that God had given that man. Thou shall not commit adultery. Well, actually, can you please turn to 2 Samuel? Turn to 2 Samuel chapter 12, please. Turn to 2 Samuel chapter 12. Thou shall not commit adultery. What is that? If you commit adultery, you're stealing yourself from your spouse. You know, you belong to your spouse if you're married. Husbands, you belong to your wife. Wives, you belong to your husband. And if you commit adultery, you're stealing yourself from your spouse. Or you're stealing the spouse of another. That's what adultery is. Look at 2 Samuel chapter 12 and verse number 1. 2 Samuel chapter 12 and verse number 1. You may recall the story where King David took another man's wife, Bathsheba, and uh, the Lord God sends Nathan the prophet to confront David in this story. In 2 Samuel chapter 12, verse number 1, it says, And the Lord sent Nathan unto David, and he came to him and said unto him, There were two men in one city, one rich and the other poor. The rich man had exceeding many flocks and herds, but the poor man had nothing, save one little ewe lamb, which he had bought and nourished it, and he grew up together with him and with his children and did eat of his own meat and drank of his own cup and lay in his bosom and was unto him as a daughter. And there came a traveler unto the rich man and he spared to take of his own flock and of his own herd to dress for the wayfaring man that was coming to him, but took the poor man's lamb and dressed it for the man that was come to him. So Nathan's given this allegory, this story, this proverb, as you will, about a rich man that has a, a lot of lambs, a lot of sheep, great possessions. And then he has someone comes to visit him and he wants to be hospitable. But instead of giving one of his lambs for the, for the meal, 
he goes and takes that one poor lamb, sorry, that one poor man's lamb, okay, that one poor man's sheep. Verse number five. And David's anger was greatly kindled against the man. And he said to Nathan, As the Lord liveth, the man that have done this thing shall surely die. Now that is not the God, God's laws. Okay? If you stole a sheep, what were you meant to do? Restore fourfold. Okay? That was not the death penalty if you just stole a sheep. But David was so angry that this rich man would take the sh one sheep of a poor man. He says, just to kill that man. Okay? He's so angry at him. Then he says in verse number 6, and he shall restore the lamb fourfold. So that's the law of God there. Because he did this thing and because he had no pity. And Nathan said to David, Thou art the man. Thus saith the Lord God of Israel, I anointed thee king over Israel and I delivered thee out of the hand of Saul. So what happened? David had his wives. He saw this man's wife, you know, Bathsheba. He saw this one other woman. You know, this one man had this one wife. He takes her for himself. And what's the story that God uses for Nathan? The story of theft, of a man coming and stealing another man's lamb. And so I just wanted to show you that even when it comes to adultery, God uses stealing, he uses theft, he uses robbery as the equivalent to what King David did within adultery. And so this is something that I started to realize in my life. I'm saying, you know what? All sin is theft to some extent. We just saw that shall not commit adultery. You know, you can use the illustration of theft to illustrate what adultery is. Commandment number eight, thou shalt not steal. Well, that's obvious. Okay, every time you steal, you're going to have the, that one commandment there. Well, what about the next one? Commandment number nine, thou shalt not bear false witness against thy neighbor, or thou shalt not lie, as, as we would say at the door. Well, what is that? How is that theft? Well, you're stealing away from the truth. Okay, if you're lying, you're giving false witness, false reports or something, you're stealing the truth away. And commandment number 10, thou shalt, shalt not covet. You know, you desire the things that belong to others. You may not necessarily go and steal those things, but covetousness is that first step, isn't it? Before you go and steal something, you first coveted it for yourself. But coveting is basically stealing your own personal joy, your own satisfaction and contentment. Instead of you being satisfied and content with the gifts, the things that God has given you, you say, it's not enough. You know, you steal that contentment away from yourself and you go and you take from somebody else or you desire the things that belong to others. And as I said to you, brethren, I, just, I was thinking about all the kind of sins that people can commit and it's like, yeah, I can tie in stealing. You're taking something that rightfully belongs to someone else and putting it somewhere else. And so I, I do believe pretty much, I mean, unless someone can tell me a sin that doesn't fit it, I think that stealing basically is the undercurrent of all other sins that we see in the Bible. Let's go to Ephesians chapter 4. I'm almost done now. Ephesians chapter 4, please, and verse number 28. Ephesians chapter 4, verse number 28. What is the remedy for theft? How do we overcome this desire to take something that does not belong to us? It's very, very simple. Very, very simple. Ephesians chapter 4, verse number 28, please. Ephesians chapter 4, we'll end on this one. Ephesians chapter 4, verse number 28. Ephesians chapter 4, verse number 28 says, Let him that stole steal no more, but rather let him labor. Isn't that the issue? Isn't that why people go and steal? Because they're too lazy to labor for themselves, to save up and buy it for themselves. Then it's just much easier if I just take it from someone else. What is the solution to stealing? Go and work. Go and labor. You know, the people that are poor, as I said, some people are poor on purpose because they just refuse to work and they just want the handouts. They want the government welfare. Yeah, you're stealing from the taxpayer because you're so lazy. But rather let him labor, working with his hands, the thing which is good that he may have to, him, to give to him that needeth. That's what God wants us to be. Rather than taking that what belongs to others, God wants us to work that we can have enough for ourselves and then to have an abundance that we can give to people that go through a time of trials and needs. That's the solution to theft. Just go and work. You know, and I say to my boys and any young men you know, that might be listening in, you know, you've got to develop a work you know, ethic. You know what, if you're in school, start developing that work ethic right now. You know, start doing the best you can in your studies. Okay, start developing yourself as an individual. You know, give yourself to, to work and labor. You know, do some chores around the house. 
help mom and dad around the house. You know, I ask my boys sometimes, my kids, to help us around the house, not because I really need that much help, but really for their benefit. They can have this ethic within themselves to desire to work and be productive, and they can see the, the fruit of their hands and be able to go out there in the workplace, provide, take care of their needs, take care of their wife one day, take care of their children, and then be a blessing to other people. And give to the local church to give to the tide. You now, my children may not necessarily always have me as their pastor. They might find themselves one day in another great church. I would want nothing more for my children to give their tithe to that house of God as well. That they may be blessed. That God will prevent the devourer from destroying their things. And so, brethren, as I said, the title for the sermon tonight was Thou Shalt Not Steal, Commandment number eight. All right, let's go to a word of prayer.